everybody out there in this virtual life of ours. I'm Raven Stubbs with Women and Children. First, the bookstore. Uh, we're one of three remaining feminist bookstores in the country that is fully owned and operated by women, which we are incredibly proud of. And we wanted to welcome you all tonight to the virtual event the same way we would if you were in our store, which is by acknowledging the land that we sit on. So our bookstore stands on occupied, unceded territory of the Peoria, the Potawatomi, the Miami, and the Sioux people. We encourage you to learn more about land acknowledgement and about the rightful owner of the land in which you are watching tonight's event um, from. Um, and you can see that by going to native-land.ca. Additionally, beyond land acknowledgement, you can find yourself supporting your local grassroots native initiatives and movements. If you're in the Chicago land area, American India's Center of Chicago is a great place to start. And we will also share the link to that place in our uh, chat box, okay? So if you haven't already purchased tonight's book, which you probably haven't because it doesn't release until March. Um, however, we have gotten an early exclusive so starting next week, you can purchase the book early from us. You can visit our website at womenandchildrenfirst.com and place a pre-order for it. And we will gladly um, allow you to either receive your book via curbside pickup if you're in the Chicago area, or we will ship it to you in any of the continental U.S., okay? We also have made it convenient for you to buy the book tonight by clicking on the buy the book link that you see is a button at the end at the bottom of your screen yeah point below <laughs> you can buy the book there um we're very happy to see the purchases come through um our website will also provide a calendar of upcoming events so one that is getting much buzz is our march 1st event with rhonda jar author of love is an x country so feel free to check that out as well now for our event tonight we are uber excited to have Tamara Winfrey Harris and Patrice Burrell Yursik. I'll introduce them and then turn the floor over to them. At any point during the conversation, if you find yourself having a question, please feel free to ask your question in the chat bar, okay? So, dear black girls, my first reaction to this book happened around the slashes and the dashes of gear biracial slash multiracial slash mixed girl by Faith. And if the title alone didn't convey that it was trying to grab those black girls up into a hug, the text did when the author continuously does the work and say, you may be half dash black slash one dash quarter slash one dash eight slash one dash eight sixteenth slash some new mathematical equation slash an unknown amount but you are not fragmented this book made me sigh um with the remembrance of the black girls that i typically don't hold dear in my conversations and definitions of black girls like the not so little black girls I once saw in a South Dakota watering hole, told to me by Hannah. Between the pages of Dear Black Girls are not only love letters for you, but as I have found, there are also love letters for the sisters you have yet to meet. I am so excited to kick this event off. So our guest tonight, starting with Tamara Winfrey Harris, is the author of The Sisters Are All Right, Are All Right, which won several awards, including the Harlem Book Fair's Phyllis Wheatley Award. Um, her work also appears in the books The Burden, African Americans, and the Enduring Impact of Slavery, and The Lemonade Reader, Beyond Beyonce, or Beyonce, Black Feminism and Spirituality, as well as in publications such as The New York Times, Cosmopolitan, New York Magazine, Ebony, The American Prospect, and Mrs. Magazine. She is also Vice President of Community Leadership and Effective Philanthropy at the Central Indiana Community Foundation. Welcome, Tamara. Hello from the land of the Miami, Potawatomi, and Delaware. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for that. And then we have Patrice Grill-Yursik, 
who is the founder of Afrobella and was named one of WWD's 50 most influential people in the multicultural beauty market. Some call her the godmother of brown beauty blogging. Okay, so add that to her respect. Okay. So you have been featured in Essence, Albany, and Glamour, among other major outlets. She has been heard on NPR and the Michael Bayson Show, amongst other radio programs. She has covered red carpets at the BET Awards, New York Fashion Week, and the Academy Awards. She has worked with PG Beauty as the official partner for My Black is Beautiful. Yersik was the natural hair blogger at Black Voices and was one of the first writers of Vogue Italia's Vogue Black Online and created the, nat the weekly natural hair diary feature on Essence.com. So thank you and welcome, Patrice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yes. So without further ado, the event is officially yours. And right. I will come back. I will also be including links in the chat bar. So thank you and welcome. Thank, thank you. you. We, I, we did not plan this yellow moment, guys. We didn't, we didn't, but this is how we go together, right? Right there. <laughs> right there. <laughs> I am so excited and I'm so honored to be here with you. This is your first book event for this book. It is. Ba -ba -ba. It is. Yay. I'm so excited to be able to do it with you. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, this is, I'm honored to be included. And I think this is just, it's such a, a beautiful your work in general is for us and by us and speaks to us, but this book is so special. And what you've done here is so intentional. And so I've watched the whole journey of you beginning to, you know, ask people to contribute letters or to, to come up with the whole idea of it and see it come to this point. It's beautiful. This is a beautiful journey and I'm honored to be part, a little bit part of it. So, <laughs> so I've got questions for you. Do you? How do you want to do this? First of all, do you want to start out by reading, or do you want me to start out by asking you questions? You know, maybe I'd love to start off by reading the preface. Yes, because I think it'll, it'll give listeners kind of some context about why why I wrote the book. Please, and then we can fire away. All right, you take it away. So the preface is: We are all right, my black girls. You tell me things. You tell me how you love your mamas, but kind of hate them too. You tell me about the Ugh, fuck boys at school who text dirty messages. You tell me about beauty insecurities, two big noses and five heads. You tell me who you like, showing me pictures of boys on IG giggling, ain't he cute? You tell me these things and I smile. It's been a while since I was a girl, but I remember hating my parents' rules and being insecure about my looks. I remember the trifling boys and super fine crushes. Some things about black girls never change. But you tell me other things too. You tell me about anxiety or depression that will not let go. You tell me about social media memes that leave you feeling demeaned and hated. You tell me about boys and men who violate you and families who cannot deal with the devastation of sexual assault. You tell me about carrying the burden of friends and family who have been murdered. You tell me about families who cannot accept your queer identity. You tell me about schools that suspend you for petty reasons. You tell me how people assume that you are angry, unfeminine, grown and hypersexual before you can even find out who you are for yourself. You tell me these things and I worry. I remember that the world does not value black girls like it should. Some things that are too common in black girls must change. Black girl, the world looks at you with a white patriarchal gaze, a fixed negative view that says whiteness and maleness are superior and valuable while you, black and a girl are deficient. Makes your life harder, makes my life harder too. We are sisters in a unique struggle. Black women know the things you may experience when you are a black girl. We have lived through many of them ourselves. Many of us have been told our skin is too dark, 
Our hair is too short. Our noses are too big. Many of us have been sent out of classrooms, away from education we desperately need. Many of us have difficult relationships with our mamas or our daddies. Many of us have been called loud or ghetto. Many of us have unchecked anxiety. Many of us have lost friends to violence. Many of us have struggled to understand how our blackness and girlhood intersect with other identities. Many of us have walked down the street past men who say ugly things. We understand. That is why something else that black girls like you tell me breaks my heart. You tell me that some black women seem to have fixed negative ideas about black girls too. It is too often other black women who say black girls hair is not fit for the classroom. Black women who fuss that black girls are not ladylike. Black women who complain about black girls bad attitudes. Black women who expect black girls to stare down depression. Black women who chastise black girls about being fast. You tell me it is too often black women who reinforce the idea that you are deficient and of less value, angry, unfeminine, grown and hypersexual before you can even find out who you are for yourself. My dearest black girl, if this has been your experience, I am so sorry. There are black women in the world who love you fiercely, but many of us are still hurting from the ways we were treated as girls and young women. We do our best. We don't mean to sound like all those other people. We want desperately for our black girls to be okay in this country that does not care much for black people or girls. And sometimes our love gets twisted by the lives we've been told about ourselves and each other for too long. What we want to say is black girls, what we want to say to black girls is, I was once you. I know the world thinks every black girl is a hoe. I wanna protect you from that. I want you to make good decisions. I want you to be safe and happy and I am scared for you. But too often on the outside, our fear sounds like disgust. Look at you out there being fast. If we want to be free and happy, black women and black girls must love each other well. We cannot afford to look on each other with the same eyes as those who hate us. Our gaze must be one of love, empathy, acceptance for all black girl identities and experiences. And I'm going to, to skip over some of this, but just end and say that in this book, black women will set aside our fears and our hurt to model the way we need to love and care for each other. We will approach you with love, honesty, vulnerability, and grace because you are us, we are you, we are all right, and we love you. That is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And it sets the tone, it gives the explanation. And for people who have not yet picked up the book, mm -hmm. there's a little bit more in there that explains a little bit more of the context mm -hmm. of the work that you've put in here. Um, and here is a little excerpt of that again. This book is an antidote to the world's un ugly, unforgiving gaze. So mm -hmm. the intention of shifting the gaze that others have and controlling it ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. That's what this yeah. is all about. Yeah. Um, which leads you know, perfectly into some of the questions that I have for you all about this book. So tell me, what was the trigger that made you realize you needed to write this book and that this book was necessary? It was, it was, it was a couple of things. One was when I was on the book tour for The Sisters Are All Right. Yes. And one of the things, I was traveling around with my girl, Deshaun, who was acting as my publicist, and, you know, we were leaving a book event and we both started talking about how we noticed how sometimes when groups of women who were talking about, you know, we were having conversations about stereotypes because that's what the book was about, how when they would talk about us as women, like they completely rejected all of those stereotypes that are placed on us. But then when they talked about younger women and girls, they didn't. Mm. And very often they talked about them through that same lens. And it was, I remember the exact thing that we talked about. We were at a book event and this woman said, um, I don't I don't know. I guess these young women, they sure are free with their bodies. Um, I guess that's liberated. Like, and then she, like she had this look of disgust on her face. Yeah. Um, 
And, you know, that really struck us because it's like, what messages are younger women and girls getting from us? Right. Um, if we're looking at them that way. And then the other thing was more practical. I was doing a book event with two of my dear friends, Dr. Carolyn Strong and Dr. Tiffany Monford Dent. And it was going to be an inter intergenerational workshop. And I just got this idea that maybe the 12 girls who were part of the workshop, it would be great if they had a letter from a black woman in their goodie bag when they left. And so I just went on social media um, and said, hey, can I get 12 letters to black girls? And black women came through in an amazing, amazing way. Um, I got more than 50 letters from around the world. Wow. Um, one as far, from as far as Switzerland. Um, people sent me stacks of journals along with books. People hmm. sent me like letters on scented paper. Like black women really showed up for black girls. And I read the first letter, ugly cried, and realized that I had to do more of this. So, yeah. you know, I've continued to collect letters for black girls, but the reality is I got a day job. Right. <laughs> it's hard to like, get letters to girls and so i knew one way to do that was to put them in a book to get Absolutely. them as girls as possible so the letters that were solicited or that were sent in are those part of this book as well they are so many of the letters you'll read were, were from that initial initial solicitation mm -hmm. and letters that have come in since but then because i wanted to make sure because i wanted to address some specific topics mm -hmm. and because I wanted to make sure that as many black girls as possible saw their identities mirrored in the book. I had to specifically make sure um, that some women were there. Like I specifically wanted um, the voices of trans women in the book. Yes. I specifically Absolutely. wanted biracial women in the book. Absolutely. I specifically wanted, you know, in the chapter on family, for, to hear from a woman who was adopted mm -hmm. and hear, like so i had to go out and, and solicit some of those letters where i didn't already have them right so it's a very uh intentional inclusivity to capture the, our, our full spectrum mm -hmm. right so one of the things that was mentioned in the intro is that specific effort to capture and to speak to our fragmented identities. Mm -hmm. um, so that begs the question, who is this book for? Is it just for black girls? It, so in both my books, and I guess in my writing in general, I want to give black women and girls something that we don't often get, which is to be centered, yes. to be centered in conversations about women and centered in conversations about race. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that said, I think there are some experiences um, that women and, and girls share. So I hope in the, in the same way that many, many black women and, and black girls read many books that don't have us centered, um, but that we still gain from them. I think, I think women can gain from the book. So not just, not just girls. I think, um, you know, girls that are not black and women that are not black can also gain from the book. I mean, everybody um, can understand the experience of not feeling pretty, of being unsure, of, you know, feeling depressed, um, of having a difficult relationship with a family. I mean, so, some of those things are universal. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I will say, this leads into my next question. As somebody who was asked to contribute and wrote a letter of her own, um, the act of, of being asked to do so uh, stimulates a necessary introspection that I found very helpful. And it also, the act of participating and writing the letter it dredged up a lot of memories. And some of those are, you know, some of your, your darkest memories are memories that should be left behind, but sometimes it looks, it's good to look at those things in the light, you know? Um, so it was, there's, there's a measure of catharsis in there and a measure of, you know, I'm speaking to my younger self, but at the same mm -hmm. time, I'm still talking to the self that I am. Um, and that we are still the same person, you know? Yes, yes. I, 
Yes, I love I love that. And I think for that reason, the book is cathartic for the writers as well as for the girls who right. are reading it. Um, and for women, like I've I've read some of these letters to adult women. They've been like, oh my gosh, I need that letter. Mm -hmm. um, because some of those things, I mean, we we all we really are a little bit the same little girls that we were. Yeah. You know, just all grown up. And, yeah. you know, some of our fears and, and joys have followed us along, you know? Right. Yeah. And pain. Sometimes we're carrying mm -hmm. it around in a backpack we might not even know we have on. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. You know, because you said it, Patrice, <laughs> will you read your letter? Yes, I will read my letter. I will read my letter. Okay. So um, here is my letter. Should I tell people what what page it's on, or just start reading? Sure, it is on page one nineteen. Page one nineteen. For those who are following along. Okay, here's my letter. Hey there, lovely. I want to tell you a story about myself, what I was going through when I was around your age. I went through a rough time in my teenage days. At school, the group that I thought were my best friends all turned on me, and I went from having a crew to not knowing where to eat lunch or who to sit next to anymore, and it was the worst. At home, my parents were fighting a lot. Infidelity almost broke up their marriage, and I knew too much too early, more than I wanted to know. It felt like I had to choose sides between my mom and my dad, and that was tough. Besides that, I wasn't good at most subjects, and I couldn't imagine a future for myself. I compared myself to others, and I felt so much less than them less pretty, less cool, less intelligent, less everything. I was shouldering a lot of heavy burdens all at the same time. Even though I was dealing with all of those things, I was supposed to somehow keep it together and be strong and get through it and still get good grades. But I remember being angry and sad and feeling powerless and my grades went down. I started making bad decisions about food and my parents could not understand that I was developing an eating disorder. They didn't know how to help me. So I got a few tough talks and a frustrated attitude instead of the kind of understanding that I really needed. My parents are old school. Maybe you know how that goes too. So I wound up going to the guidance counselor's office. Her name was Dr. Peer, and Dr. Peer's office turned out to be the best place for me. It was a safe place away from all of my sources of stress where I could talk out all of my feelings about everything I was dealing with. It was a place to make plans for my future. On Sunday, I would go with my family to church and pray. And during the week after class, I could go to the counselor's office to lay my burdens down. She never gave me the answers. I used to get so annoyed, like, just tell me what to do. But she never would. Instead, she would let me talk things out and find the answers for myself. And every now and then, she would ask a question like, how do you feel about that? It was my first introduction to therapy. It's how I first was able to recognize that my issues were deeper than just being sad or going through hard times or being a teenager, whatever that means. It was the first time I understood what depression and anxiety looked like. And it helped me to cope, begin to cope with all of the stuff that was weighing me down. It helped me realize that I couldn't control what I was experiencing, but I could try to control my reactions. I honestly think I would have been lost and could have made some monumentally bad life decisions if I hadn't spent as much time as I did in that office confronting what I was dealing with and figuring out my feelings. So I want you to know it's okay to seek help. It's important to find your own safe space where you can lay your burdens down. I want you to know that going to a psychiatrist, therapist, or counselor does not make you weak. It doesn't mean you're broken. It doesn't mean you're crazy. It means you're strong enough to recognize that you could use some perspective. I want you to know that it's often necessary to confront your pain, even when it may be more convenient to ignore it. You gotta deal with it to get past it most of the time. And I want you to know this is coming from a place of understanding. Know that you aren't alone. Know that trouble doesn't last always. Know that it can and truly will get better if you keep holding on and do what you need to do to heal and grow. I get it, I feel you, and I love you, Patrice. But some call me Afrabella. 
Love that. Thank you. you know, what I loved about that letter is, is one, you tell girls to prioritize their mental health and, and their well-being. But I also love it because you acknowledge like the, the difficult situations that can happen in girls' families. They very often they're not allowed to talk about, right? No. I mean, if 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 a girl has old school parents and you know she tries to go. Well, you know, I'm really scared because you and you like you and Dad keep arguing, and Dad was unfaithful. They would say, "Stay out of grown folks." Bit like what? Exactly. What? Is, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and where do you go to talk about that? You know. Yeah. And how do you explain it to them? I'm definitely writing this letter. It's something that. Um, you know, talking to my parents about some of this, they're like, why are you trying to make me feel bad? I'm not. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to point out what I went through. Um, and I think now we're in a time where there's more uh, information about therapy and counseling and, and understanding that it's not just go to church and pray it out that is always the answer um, or that helps everybody. You know, mm -hmm. um, it just took my dad and my mom a longer time to get there. And I definitely remember trying to explain going to a doctor because I was making myself sick all the time. And my parents were like, she's got a stomach problem, like something's wrong. And I was like, it's not really that, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> how do I explain it to you? And my dad got angry at me. Like he was angry. He was like, why would you make yourself throw up? And I'm like, I can't explain this to you. You yeah. know what I mean? That's, that's something yeah. I don't want to do, yeah. but I can't help but do. You know what I mean? Like, and this is above your pay grade right now. So mm -hmm. delegate the authority. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, I this, this is definitely the letter that I needed when I was a teenager and it's still a letter that I need mm -hmm. right now. And is this a time where I can tell my little, my little full circle story with this? Yes, yes, yes. Because yes. I love it. Yes, it's so funny. Um, so because of this letter and this being out, um, I had been thinking about that doctor, Dr. Peer, and just, it was really serendipitous. I had posted something completely unrelated in a different Facebook page about my high school and about, you know, something about my high school. And I see that like come in from, from her name. And I'm like, ah. You, I just mentioned you in a book. Do you remember me? And I was able to reach out to her and say, hi, I saw you like my post. I've, you know, I didn't, I didn't say I've been looking for you for years because I haven't been, but I mean, like, I've wondered how you've been through the years and we were uh -huh. able to reconnect. I sent her a picture of the letter. So she got to see her name is in the book. She was so surprised and honored, I think, by, by being mentioned and the funny part is I asked her after we had the conversation, how long had you been at my school? She was only there from 94 to 96. She had, it was barely there. You know what I mean? So she was just at the right time at the right window. So to be able to kind of give her her flowers for something that was just a blip in her overall career and to know that you made a difference in this time that you may not have been aware that you made a difference um she was she seemed very honored by that and i was very happy to be able to share that with her so thank you for the gift of that um i think she may not have realized how important the work she was doing was and you know and it also speaks to one thank you for that gift and it speaks to the importance like when when a when a woman can make a connection with a girl and actually yes. listen and make her feel heard yes. like it means a lot and the ripples of that mm -hmm. you know like i mean because i had that moment with her you know i have two nieces who are in that high school now i've been able to tell them well do you have a guidance counselor if you don't mm -hmm. it's okay to talk to somebody it's okay to do that mm -hmm. i know because i was you and you know maybe some of the things you're going through are heavier or lighter or different but you got to put them down somewhere and it can't just be in the confession booth all the time or you know maybe that may not yeah. be the way that that leads yeah. you to the help that you need i love um 
I also love that you talked about your parents in the letter. Uh, they may um, not love that, but. <laughs> 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 but I, one of my favorite, um, so one of the chapters in the book is called It Takes a Village. Yes. I um, mean, it's the, it's the chapter about parenting or caregiving. And I think, ooh, it's hard to pick a favorite chapter, but I really like that chapter. Yeah. And I like it because so often, um, you know, we know that the majority of Black children are not raised now in traditional families, right. but that doesn't mean they aren't raised in loving families. But very often society can act like black families are problematic mm -hmm. because they don't, I don't even, I mean, even, yeah, <laughs> because they don't look like traditional families and that can leave girls, you know, I was interviewing a bunch of girls um, with a friend for another project and you know, they talked about, you know, how teachers would like slyly ask them, is, is your father at home? Mm -hmm. Or do you know your, like ways of making them feel like whatever their family dynamic is, that, it, that it's somehow less than. Right. And so it was really important for me for the, in this chapter to find people. There's an amazing letter from my friend Rochelle about being raised by her grandparents. Um, well, this might bring me to my next question. Ooh, okay. Oh. So you did not write your you did not write a letter. You wrote the preface. You wrote introductions for uh -huh. the chapters. But which letter is your favorite? And would you read from the letter that you would describe as your favorite? That's like picking among my babies. Pick a baby. <laughs> I, I didn't know. You know, I started to read. I started to read. Pick an excerpt oh. from a baby. <laughs> I, I, I started to read the very first letter that I received. Actually, when I first issued a call for letters, that was the one that made me re made me realize I had to keep doing this. It's by Nicole Jackson, but I'm going to let the people on the line watching, you read that when you get the book. And I'm going to read this one by Reverend Brandy Mamitzraim. Um, it's from the parenting. It's, it's one of my favorites in the, in the uh, family chapter. And it's about daughtering. And I just think it's so, so beautifully written. Um, and I just want to share. So dear little sis, daughtering ain't easy. Can I say that? We daughter more than a relationship. It's a, it's a thing we do. We daughter. We carry on our faces the reflection of our mothers, her hopes, her dreams, the parts of her she loves and fears the most. We daughter. We bear the burden of her mistakes, her shames. We may even bear the marks of the preemptive beatings meant to keep us from making mistakes we didn't even understand were possible. We daughter. We see the world through our mother's eyes. We hear life through our mother's ears. We even hear our mother's words echo from our own mouths. We daughter. We carry our mothers, all of who they really were and were afraid of becoming, who they wanted to be and couldn't figure out how to be, and who they couldn't figure out how to not be. Before we know who we are, our mothers become a template for our identity, our hopes, our futures. We daughter. It takes a spiritual resilience to daughter. It takes intentionality of self-knowledge and radical love to daughter. To daughter, we must live unraveling the giant myth of our mother that exists solely in our minds and finding beneath it who we really are. Daughtering ain't easy. I know my mommy loved me, her mama loved her, and my mommy's grandmama loved my grandma. I come from a line of women with strong, distinct personalities, introvert, extrovert, tomboy, girly girl, science, humanities, nature lover, book lover, artsy, sporty. We are explicitly who we are. Our daughters are our opposites. My mommy is the outdoorsy tomboy science type. Her mother was a librarian whose mother was a farmhand. My mommy had to stay inside, play the piano, sing, and read books. My mommy wanted to give me all the freedoms she didn't have, and I love her for that. I played softball, warming up before a game, the ball hit me in the face. My jaw was wired shut for six weeks. I tried to be a tomboy, 
I broke my wrist and all my toes, and I ripped up my favorite shirt, an ivory turtleneck with little purple hearts and lacy sleeves. I tried to garden. I freaked out when I got dirt on my hands. I ran inside when I saw a worm. My mom did me did put me in dresses, blue dresses, and rubber soled dress shoes so I could run. I don't run. She wanted me to be free. That wasn't freedom to me. Daughtering ain't easy. I was 20 when I realized I could just be me. I fell in love with the philosophy my mom was forced to read. I built my own home library. I stopped trying to play sports. I was 30 when I realized I didn't have to walk in my mother's footsteps. I chose a life that makes sense to me. I refused to give up my dreams for the sake of, sake of stability. I was 35 when I realized that I don't have to try to erase my mother's image from my skin, that seeing her and me doesn't erase me. At 40, I still argue we look nothing alike. I wear pink and purple and ruffles and lace and play in makeup and have tattoos, and I am decidedly myself. I still struggle to daughter. It ain't easy. I hope you figure it out sooner, little sis. I hope you learn that your mother's choices in life were hers and not yours. I hope you learn how to emerge from your mother's image and reflection and value your own. I hope you learn how to choose your own path, neither repeating nor running from your mother's past. I hope you learn how to value the differences between you and your mom. I hope you learn how to love your mom for who she is and how she loved you. I hope you learn how to hold loosely to her faith her hopes, her dreams, her fears, choosing to keep what works best for you. I hope you grow into the woman you were meant to be, more than your mother's wildest dreams. I hope you learn how to live in your own skin, follow your own faith, carry your own hopes, chase your own dreams. When you have a daughter, I hope you go easy on her and remember what it was like to daughter because we daughter and daughtering ain't easy. Brandy. That's just so good. I was I mean, that was so good. Oh so my God. Good. And what I was, there's so many thoughts that were just washing over me as I was listening to you read and as I was reading along with this. There is an oral tradition here, you know, like, and you read a letter mm -hmm. like that that relies on on that repetition, mm -hmm. that call, mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that mm -hmm. it's a, a call with mm -hmm. a response in your mind. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like you read it and you're like, I, it makes you nod in response. Mm -hmm. It makes, mm-hmm. And it gives you that, you know what I mean? And this is, some of these are short and sweet and to the mm -hmm. point, some of them are longer form, but there's a poetry here in some of these that it's the kind of book that I think lends itself to reading aloud in a lot of ways, but it also is the kind of book that lends itself to being read quietly just for yourself. Mm -hmm. Does that even make sense? You know? I, I agree. Like I go back and read some of these letters because I feel like not only do I love the messages, but they really are so lyrical. Yes, you know? absolutely. Like that that one I feel like is so lyrical, the repetition of we daughter and it, and it speaks to that any relationship, including the mother-daughter relationship, is an active thing yes. that you are a part of. It's an active living thing. And I also like that this, this, you know, acknowledges what very often girls don't realize when they're like 15 and 16 and they're just mad, mm. or, you know, 12 and they're just mad. Their mother put them in that stupid, itchy dress that they don't want to wear. How our parents do their best. Say it. And they're trying to, because they love you, it just may not feel like it. All they can do or are doing frequently is passing on what they themselves were taught to do, that they see as the thing that is best for you, because it was the thing that was best for them. And it is working sometimes from a limited palette, a limited toolbox. Mm -hmm. And you have to, it takes a, a maturity and a perspective to recognize the the girl in your mother and to recognize the you know the person who's just like you trying to figure it out that it's not 
mom who knows everything. It is mom who's probably scared as hell trying to figure it out, you know, and they're trying to remember what her own mom might have done. And maybe what her own mom did wasn't a healthy or good thing, you know, but that's all that, that you got, you know? Um, so reading this, I was just like, that is so resonant for so many of us. And I think it's also illustrative. Some had times it takes generations for healing to happen. Yes. Because like each woman, you know, each of her foremothers like tried to undo what their mother did by doing differently for her daughter, but not realizing that what her daughter needed was actually what her mother did, you know, you know. You know what might be your next book today? A friend of mine sent me a letter she wrote to her mom. Ooh. Oh wow! So, <laughs> that might be your next book. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> we might have to talk about that one later. <laughs> my mother, I love that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I read it and I was like, "Ooh, I don't know if y'all ready for this." Right. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you just need to get it out. You know, maybe you just yeah. need to get it out. So yeah, it's. Anyway, um, let me look at my questions here. Um, so this is one of the letters that you would say lingered with you. Do you have a letter that you think surprised you? Because you've been doing this work for a minute. You've been interviewing girls. You've been, you know, hearing these stories anecdotally. It was, you know, a lot of the stories that shared experiences that weren't mine. Mm but it just, it gave me into the, a window into things that other girls and other women feel. Mm -hmm. um, like like a Bailey, um, tr a trans woman who wrote a letter and talked about what it, feel, what it felt like to finally see herself standing in front of a mirror in, you know, bra and panties. Mm. How that was a moment for her. I never, I never thought about that. Yeah. Um, and I think that by, by hearing those stories, it can help us be more gentle um, and loving when we're dealing with other girls and other women who haven't had our exact experience. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And it speaks to what you were talking about earlier, that sometimes we are the ones who put our sisters in a box mm -hmm. and we are the ones who police mm -hmm. and who, you know, make assumptions about how things must be. Uh, this is a chance for us to learn as well from other perspectives. There's a, you know, there was a great Hannah um, who wrote about, you know, being, she's a, a black woman who spent a lot of time being raised in a white family mm -hmm. and being the only black person in a lot of spaces. And she writes about running into two little black girls who were also there with white people at a North Dakota watering hole and all of the things she would want to tell them about what it feels like to be the only black person, you know, yeah. in your family yeah. and in spaces. And that's, you know, I've certainly had the experience of being the only one. I think every black person has, but not the only one in your family, like in your, but at least you get to usually go home right. to a black family. Yeah. And that's something I couldn't understand until I saw it, you know, through her letter. I'm wondering also if this is a book that can be a life raft or um, a rescue rope thrown to people who are in those situations where maybe they are the only and they don't have voices of their sisters, you know, yeah. you were talking about that. And one of the things that danced in the back of my head when you were talking is during the election cycle and right in that awful window of time where we didn't know what was up and down and what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing a video of a gentleman wearing a red hat, introducing his adopted son and saying, I can't be Mm -hmm. racist yeah. this is my kid yeah. you know and it just made me think about what does a kid like that grow up to know of his own culture of his right. self of his identity of his community what is his right. community you know um you've been taught by the person who saved you and who rescued mm -hmm. you to, to to dislike and to disdain yourself and your reflection so maybe 
the not to put a lot on the book like this, okay? But, yeah. <laughs> but, but maybe this is the book that can help somebody who is in that family in a place like that, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and to let you know that you're not alone through your circumstances. So um, I don't even know those little girls at the watering hole, but I'm going to say thank you <laughs> for them. Um, yeah. So the subtitle here on the front of this book, mm -hmm. letters from your sisters on stepping into your power. How do we do that? So I, I think part of it is knowing that you're accepting that you're okay. Mm. I guess that's the theme for both of, both of my books. It's, it's the idea that knowing that we are all right. And yeah. that doesn't mean that we're without problems. Everybody has problems, but intrinsically we have value. Um, and our the, the way we look naturally is okay. The way we move in the world is okay. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. And I think very often we get the, the exact opposite message. Yeah. Um, we definitely get it through society. Um, sometimes we get it too much from, you know, even parents and loved ones that want to shape you so you're so, you know, you're OK and you fit in with, with it with the world. And then the message can just be like we've talked about this. We've talked about this with hair. Yeah. Like, you know, your 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 hair story that you shared and the sisters are all right. Like your mother, your mother who had to sit in her room when her hair wasn't done as a child, then wanted you, your hair to be right, yep. but sure can feel like there's something wrong with your hair, Patrice. Yeah, yeah. Take all that for it to be right, you know? Yep, you have to teach so them think, by doing yourself sometimes, you know? So I think, you know, part of it that, that I hope this, this book does is send the repeated message that you are not alone you know, you are not the only person going through what you're going through. You are not the only person with your identity. It's okay. Right. Um, which is why I would love for you to read, you know, one of the letters written by another Chicagoan, my friend Carolyn Strong on page um, 15, Dear Brown Skin Black Girl. Dear um, Brown Skin Black Girl. You know, one of the things that she spoke about very eloquently was you know, growing up as a dark brown skinned girl and how it made her feel. Yeah. Okay, well, let me read right. Carolyn's letter. Dear brown skinned black girl, if no one else tells you this today, hear it from me. You and your dark chocolate shell are beautifully and wonderfully made. As a young girl growing up with chocolate skin and 4C hair, the tightest of tight kinks and curls, I didn't see anyone on television that looked like me. And if somehow a girl like me did make it to the screen, she was usually being made fun of. And that made me feel like I was not beautiful. And I have spent the last 35 years trying to turn that feeling around. I'm going to do my best right now to tell you the things I wish someone had told me back then. Read this as often as you need to be okay. They hate you because they ain't you. Look around, love. People who don't have what you have and who don't look how you look are paying big bucks to get what the creator bestowed upon you for free. The next time you see a girl on Instagram tan to death with lip fillers, butt implants, and box braids, just remember yours is free and organic. We are slowly, ever so slowly, moving towards a world that sees the beauty in you, in us. As I write this, Miss Universe, Miss America, Miss USA, and Miss Teen USA are all beautiful, vibrant black women of varying hues and hair texture. are a visual representat representation of all the ways black girls can be and are physically beautiful. In the meantime, know that the absence of dark skinned girls in mainstream culture says more about the people making that culture than it says about you. As a girl, I remember thinking, What's wrong with me? I had a ton of answers and each one made me feel worse than the one before it. I don't want that for you. Bump that. Your melanin, the thing that controls how brown you are, it is an asset. People may give you crap about it and you may not appreciate that now, 
But know this, honey, the saying black don't crack is real and melanin is the best anti-aging cream you could ever ask for. <laughs> Beautiful black girl, if you let it, this world will take your soul and try to convince you that you handed it over willingly. It is my job as a fellow black girl to stop that from happening. I start by telling you that you are beautiful. The creator makes no mistakes, but also know that in your beauty lies an ability to do and be anything you want. And if nothing else, know that this chocolate girl loves you. Carolyn, she put her email. <laughs> <laughs> this ends with her email address. I'm not reading it, but it is here for whoever purchases this book. You can literally hit Carolyn up. I love that. Wow. Yes. Okay. So this is about community, but literally you can create community from. Yes. That's awesome. That's very powerful. And I think, you know, because I think about that, you know, one of the things, again, when I've talked to girls, um, a lot of girls said, you know, I grew up watching Disney Channel, Nickelodeon, and all those girls on all those channels, all those blonde, white girls don't look anything like me. Mm -mm. And so I was like, where, 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 they were like, where am I supposed to be? And then, you know, other people added, and then when you see a dark skinned girl, or, you know, God forbid, a dark skinned fat girl, it's always the butt of jokes. And so what does that say? Unless there's someone to say, no, you're beautiful. And that's not reflective of what's actually beautiful. Absolutely. It's like you have to piece together role models for yourself as best as you can until you have somebody who's like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. I can see that. You know, you're talking and I'm thinking about me growing up watching Give Me a Break and, you know, TV shows, it's just anything where I could see a fat black woman be seen as beautiful and be seen as talented. And Nell Carter was one of the first ones for me who I can think of that I looked at. Missy Elliott, you know what I mean? A woman who you see and you're like, that is what I could be, you know? Yeah. 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 So visual is necessary, but this is about the mental. Um, I can't believe the time has flown so quickly. It's, I know. You know, it's easy to chat. It's so easy to chat to you. It's 6.53. I, I love talking to you. I know. I love talking to you, too. And I want to make sure we don't um, mess up the uh, the instructions that we were given because we have questions we have to. So audience questions. I don't know um, if we have audience questions. Um, they are submitted through a box at the bottom of the screen. So click yeah, the box I'm for the seeing them over here. I'm not I'm not seeing any questions. No questions. If there are no questions, I will gladly, I'd love to close I, with the epilogue. I don't want to step on anybody's questions. So if there are any questions, now is the time to ask it. Mm -hmm. I have one last question for you, and I do want you to close with the epilogue. But my last question before the epilogue is what do you want Black girls who have not yet read this book to know about this book and Black women? I want Black girls to know that this is for you. In this book, Black women showed up for you and they're going to talk to you with love and with vulnerability um, and that we love you um, and that we are the same and hold on to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what about women? Because I think this book is for women as well. And honestly, women need to know the same, really. <laughs> I mean, we do. We need to have that reinforced that we like, I am you and you are me. Yeah. And we can get free together. Absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, that's the only way we're going to get free. That is the only way. That is the only way. So pick up this book and you're going to read a little bit from the epilogue for us. I am, going to, I am going to read the epilogue to close us out. Okay. So the epilogue is pick up your oyster knife. I love you, black girl. I love black girls in Afro puffs and black girls in bundles of Remy. I love the daddy's girls and the fatherless ones. I love the little sisters who make straight A's and the ones who skip school. I love the hood girls and the suburban girls and the country girls too. I love the quiet girls and the loud girls, the lip smacking, smart talking ones. I love the saved girls and the heathen ones. I love the girls who stay in sweatshirts and J's 
and the ones in tight Fashion Nova fits. I love the happy girls and the anxious girls and the girls battling depression. I love the trans girls living defiantly. I love the girls in the library and the ones on the basketball court. I love the virgins and the young mamas. I love the girly girls and the butch girls. I love the girls who fight. I love the girls who love boys and the girls who love girls and the girls who love both or neither. I love you, Black girl, unconditionally. And whether you are 15 or 50, you hear me? Today, I love you whether you look or act like they say you should. You are not wrong. And when you are wrong, I love you with all your flaws. No matter what choices and mistakes you have made, no matter where you live, no matter what you look like, no matter what thing has happened to you. And the greatest thing you can learn is to love yourself unconditionally too. It may be the hardest thing you have to learn. I hope the letters in this book have shown you how. One other thing, Black girl, you must learn to love other Black women and girls the same way. Love us whether we look or act like they say we should. We are not wrong. And when we are wrong, love us with all our flaws. No matter what choices and mistakes we have made, no matter where we live, no matter what we look like, no matter what thing has happened to us. This does not mean that you have to become a target for another black girl's pain or anger or trauma. It doesn't mean you have to silence yourself in the face of black women. It means you must give your sisters grace and understanding the benefit of the doubt. So few people give us that. We owe it to each other. We have to acknowledge each other's humanity, even maybe especially when we are walking away. I hope the letters in this book have shown you how to do that too. Because we are sisters, Black girl. We have to take care of ourselves and each other. You are me, I am you, we are all right. And inside each of us are tiny pieces of our foremothers. Sarah Boone's ingenuity, Danielle Luna's unforgettable beauty, Toni Morrison's incomparable wisdom, Mamie Till's fierce love, Aretha Franklin's creativity, Martha P. Johnson's fearlessness, Harriet Tubman's will to survive, Katherine Johnson's genius, Michelle Obama's grace. Black girls are made of all that magic, birthed in the African sun, baptized by the Middle Passage and burnished by America. That is a power that no one else can claim, just us. We are sisters, you are me, I am you, and we will get free together. Zora Neale Hurston, a great black woman writer once said, I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. An oyster knife is a utensil used to crack open the shell of an oyster to get the tasty meat inside. Zora meant that she wasn't wasting time thinking about the hard parts of being black and a woman. She didn't care what other people said about her. She was busy trying to get at all the good stuff life had to offer. Celebrate your black girl life. Celebrate us. Be like Zora and get that oyster girl. Yes. <laughs> Hold on a second. You told me that you didn't write a letter. I, well, I you did. Well, you wrote uh, yeah. more than one. You wrote it. I guess that is a letter. It, it absolutely is a letter. You wrote a prologue and an epilogue. Those are letters to yes. us. So, you know, you'll find that I wrote prologue, epilogue, an introduction that kind of introduces Black girls to some of the stereotypes that impact how people see them. And then there's an intro to every chapter. Okay. that I wrote that kind of sums up the messages that they should take away. You know, I mean, that's the message and it speaks so much to the, the first question I asked you is what inspired you to write this book. This letter is a, a gift for that person who triggered that initial response to unpack your respectability. So often respectability is the thing that we are taught that is pressed into us mm -hmm. that we are made to believe is the thing that makes us whole and makes us right and makes us better and makes us good mm -hmm. 
and you speak to that problem and the importance of, of laying that veil down and seeing beyond it to the person underneath. So you, your letters are awesome. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for this book. Thank you for this whole evening. Thank you for everything. And yes, we are at 7 p.m. And here's thank you, Raven. <laughs> thank you for your contribution, Patrice. Thank you for always supporting me. Thank you for being so lovely and yellow. Aw, it is my pleasure. It is my honor, my sister in yellow. <laughs> Okay, well, I am just going to hold for a second just to see in any event that we get a last question, because uh, we do have a few minutes for a last question. I would just like to let everyone know that if they visit my website at TamaraWinfreyHarris.com, there is actually a reader experience kit that goes along with the, with the book. It's free. Um, it's got uh, questions that can facilitate uh, conversation. It's got tips on how to have intergenerational conversation. It's got an awesome playlist created by a 17 year old named Peyton Thomas. Okay. Uh, and it's got paper dolls that represent like different black girls. I love my paper dolls. That is so much fun. I love that you made this an like inclusive experience that you can take from it. There's like journal prompts that are coming out of this already. You know what I mean? And like that all of this is, Go to your website. One yeah. more time, what is it? TamaraWinfreyHarris.com. Boom. And I just put it in the chat bar. So if anybody wants to visit it straight from this call, you can go ahead and access the link that I just put into the chat bar to Tamara's website. Yeah. So as we close out, um, Tamara and Patrice, I would love to give you an opportunity to um, plug any future projects you're working on or to say thanks to anybody. If you haven't thanked your mama or something, um, we we'll definitely give you all the opportunity before we go ahead and close out. I just wanna say thank you for inviting me to be part of this. You know, I have been working on a book for a long time. This is my first um, printed book writing I've been writing on the internet for a long time. I know that. It is. So you Yeah. So thank you for including me in this. That you know, this is the first thing that I'm not just being quoted in. I'm actually written and contributed to. So thank you for including me. And um, you know, I'm I'm working on a variety of writing and with the encouragement of my friends, I'm gonna get there. So thank you. You can follow me on most platforms at Afrobella. And I want to thank Women and Children First and encourage everyone, if you're going to buy the book, please buy it from Women and Children First. It's so important to support your local independent bookstores. You are very lucky um, if you're there in Chicago to have great independent bookstores and Women and Children First is fantastic. I wish I could be there strolling through, <laughs> strolling through the bookstore because I love it so much but please, please, please support them. Thank you to my friends. I see some friends, if I see a contributor, Robin Tillotson, who, who also contributed to the book um, for, for supporting me. Um, and I keep following on Tamara Winfrey Harris. And while you're there, please sign up um, to become part of my database. On my monthly newsletter, I interview women who have contributed to the book and they say awesome things. I ask them four deep questions and one fun one. So like, if you want to know if they're like team Ronnie, Bobby, Ricky, or Mike, you find that out and also find out, find out <laughs> black girl candy. Like I ask stuff like that, but also more questions about, you know, their girlhood. Yeah. Well, thank you two so much for being here with us tonight. We were so excited to have this event. So thank you for keeping us in mind and for being willing to do it um, with us. Again, the book doesn't release until March. However, we got early access to it. So if you would like the book, please, please, please hit that buy the book button at the bottom of your screen, which is still very much so active. And afterwards, if you miss hitting the button, you can always go to womenandchildrenfirst.com to purchase the book. Again, if you're in the Chicagoland area, 
you can pick up the book for curbside pickup. And if you are not in the Chicagoland area, we will ship to you as long as you are in the continental US. So thank you all so much tonight for joining us. Um, thank you to our guests and our speakers and our author for such an amazing book. I'm still gonna read it. Um, so I'm very excited about that. I'm gonna be passing it on to you. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody. And please stay safe wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.